Last week, we learned two equally important lessons that are important uh, in our course on Islam that we have been taking since we finished the Old Testament course. The first lesson was that the Christian faith is, well, a peaceful faith. The reason why we believe that Christianity is peace is not because Mother Teresa is a nice woman, but because the Christian scripture tells us to be peaceful. Anyone who wants to push and preaches violence in the name of Christianity is not handling the word of God in a right way. The Bible has some violent passages, but they do not apply to us New Testament Christians, not in a religious, spiritual context. We are not authorized to use lethal force to spread the faith. But the other equally important lesson that we learned last week is that there is one correct way to handle scriptures. Every other way is not the correct way. There is one way to interpret each truth. Every other way would be a misinterpretation of that truth. The Bible tells us to deal with the Bible this way. Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show yourself a worker that does not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. There is a correct way of handling scriptures. Every other way is incorrect. By the way, I have been asked by somebody a few weeks ago, what if those uh, uh, Quran passages that people who claim that Islam is a violent religion, what if they were taken out of context? What if they were misinterpreted? I am not seeing that person today which is uh, very unfortunate, but uh, uh, thanks to the brethren here, this will be on uh, the uh, website, the church's website. So I hope by the end of today, we will get an answer to uh, that question, as well as we're going to straighten out some of the most common misconceptions about Islam in the Western world. Uh, when I'm back from Canada, Lord willing, that would be two weeks from now, uh, we will study the history of Islam, the origins of Islam, how did Islam start, and the life of Muhammad. In fact, the roots of Islam has already been there in the biblical times. And Muhammad, although he is officially the founder of the Islamic faith, did not start that faith from scratch. He just imported some beliefs that have already been there in Arabia. Uh, most of them came from what we know today as the Judaizers. But today we will study what Islam is really all about from the Western perspective. Islam has been a matter of controversy in the past few decades in the United States. Uh, and it has been politicized. Different politicians say different things about Islam for political reasons. In fact, we will see an example that is so clear it is almost comical. Of two uh, radical extremes of the political spectrum in the United States, if you will, and they both made a false statement about Islam. Because it is not the politician's job to tell you the truth about every faith. It is your job. Amen. That's why we're having today's Islam myth buster. This uh, presentation is not about defaming any Muslim early or modern day. The work is not against the Muslim people. It is not to raise prejudice against the Arab people. It is about the Islamic faith. Most Muslims that I know of, probably most Muslims that you are in contact with, your Dearborn doctor, for example, or your grocery store guy, or your construction uh, manager, they are nice people. But that does not mean that Islam is nice. We have to study the scripture of Islam. And, and, and by the way, uh, like uh, the Bible, there is only one way to interpret the Quran. Now, as far as I know, I'm the only one here in this congregation that I had to study the Quran for decades back in my home country uh, of Iraq. And we can spend a year studying every Quranic passage to assure that we are not taking any Quran passage out of context. Like the Bible, every passage in the Quran has to be viewed through the rest of the Quran. For example, when you read John 3.16, 
for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have it, uh, uh, everlasting life. This verse has been misused and misinterpreted to say that we do not need to obey the gospel and baptism to be saved. And the reason why this passage has been misinterpreted is because people do not view this passage within the context and through the perspective of all the rest of the biblical passages. That's why Paul said, and that's what he meant when he said, in Acts 20, 27, I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. You do not preach a part of the counsel of God. You preach the whole counsel of God. And every passage should be looked through the perspective of all the other passages. That's why we have to study the Bible every day. It's a daunting task, uh, but we have to do it because this is the only way uh, in which we can draw, grow in the knowledge of God and of his will. And that's what we will be doing today. I will give you the end result of at least the part that is relevant to you, people in the Western world. Uh, this is not in compliance with or going against any political agenda, uh, uh, simply because you say that the Islamic faith is not true or is violent does not mean that you have to be a follower of a certain political party in the United States to say that. We do not politicize the spiritual and the religious things. This presentation is about questioning the Quran's claim to be the final word of God and Muhammad's claim to, the, to be the final prophet of God. We have studied why do we believe in the Bible as the inspired word of God uh, and not the Quran uh, last week. And we will take a glimpse of that today. This is to question the Muslims' claim that the Quran promises anything, if ever. And it is to straighten out some of the most common misconceptions about Islam in the Western world. Why Islam is so enshrouded in myth? People have not been saying the truth about Islam. There are two kinds of people that talk about Islam. Muslims and non-Muslims. Non-Muslims cannot say the whole truth about Islam because they are, well, non-Muslims. They are not familiar with Islam the way Muslims are. Those people in the Muslim world who study the Quran every day, who wake up at 3 in the morning to the sound of the Quran playing through the loudspeaker of the neighborhood's mosque, and then listen to the Quran on their way uh, to work in the bus, and, and, and then the, the, the person in the next cubicle would be playing the Quran in his computer, and then you would be hearing the Quran when you were back home, and then somebody would be playing the Quran. So you get soaked in the Quranic culture. The Quran is the book that rules the community that I came from. It is a book that is recited in every funeral, in every wedding, in every event. And, 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 and that's the only way for you to be exposed to the Quran the right way, to study the Quran over and over again. Non-Muslims do not have this exposure, so they usually cannot tell you the truth about Islam. They see a Quranic passage, they quote that Quranic passage, they would think this represents Islam without looking at this Quranic passage through the perspective of the rest of what the Quran says. Muslims, on the other hand, have not been saying the whole truth about Islam. They do not want Islam to look bad especially Muslims in the Western world, especially the pro-America Muslims, the majority of Muslims that I know in Dearborn and many other places in the United States, they are here because they love America. They want to be good citizens. They want to be in the army and the police, and they want to, to uh, contribute to the American way of life. They are so good citizens, but they are Muslims culturally. So even though they follow the Islamic rituals of prayers and fastings and, and going to the mosque, they do not want to get involved in everything that the Quran tells them uh, to. Because of that, I think it is appropriate for a Christian who is a former Muslim to give you a closer look on Islam, on the truth about Islam, in a way that is both professional um, and unbiased. There are three simple rules to interpret the Quranic passages. Rule number one. If a common concept about Islam contradicts something that Muhammad said about Islam according to the Islamic tradition, what we know as hadith, a hadith is a saying of Muhammad, 
as believed by Muslims to be different than the Quran, which is believed to be the, the word of God and not of Muhammad. If a common concept about Islam contradicts what Muhammad said, then you follow what Muhammad said about Islam to be the truth about Islam and not the common concept. Because it is Muhammad who decides what Islam is all about. For example, if the common concept is that Islam is violent and Muhammad said that Islam is peace, then you believe Muhammad and you do not believe those who said that Islam is violent even though the world is filled with examples of terrorist attacks that are claimed by people who claim to be Muslims. It is Muhammad who decides what Islam is all about and not uh, uh, other people. Rule number two. If something that Muhammad said according to the Islamic tradition contradicts a Quranic passage, then you follow what the Quran says about Islam and not what Muhammad said. Because the Quran is a solid book, a strong book that is believed by every Muslim, Sunni and Shiite, modern day and 1400 years ago, and it has never undergone corruption ever since it was compiled and standardized. Different Muslims disagree among themselves on, on the hadith, the sayings of Muhammad. Sunnis have their own version of the hadith. Shiites have their own version. And, well, they believe that the Quran is from God and the hadith is from Muhammad, so the Quran has the superiority over the hadith. What's the hadith? Hadith, okay, so there are two sources, two main sources of the Islamic faith. The Quran, and the hadith. The Quran is believed by Muslims to be the word of God. The hadith is the word of Muhammad himself, okay. apart from the Quran. The Quran is one book that you can get, you can download from the internet. The hadith is not one book, it's a whole range of volumes and volumes of writings that different Muslims disagree among themselves so much on the content of the hadith that a whole field of study was developed to classify the corruption the percentage of corruption in each of those hadiths, and, and that field is taught in the Islamic universities. Rule number three, if a Quran passage contradicts another Quran passage, then you follow the Quran passage that came in a chronologically later time to be the truth about Islam and not the earlier Quranic passage. Yes, yeah, but the, yeah, I've just given you a glimpse and I will actually uh, show you the passage in the Quran that uh, tells you that, well, there has been some, quote, abrogations in the Quran. Uh, some passages clearly can contradict each other and the Quran tells us to follow the one that comes later. And, and we will see some examples. Everything that you will see on the screen applies to the modern day Muslims. You have two options, either to take me for my word or to spend years and years to study to figure out if this is true. By the way, uh, in my field of study, um, uh, the thing that I have a heart for is the apologetics of Islam versus Christianity. I have not seen a single uh, book or a, 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 like a resource of any kind that studies the Quran in a chronological order. Muslims and non-Muslims deal with the Quran as a unit. The Quran is not to be dealt with as a unit. The Quran has differences and you need to have these three simple rules in mind uh, uh, when you deal with the Quranic passage. Yes, sir. You said that when one passage contradicts another. Yes. Do you adhere to the earlier passage? No, the later passage, not the earlier. Yeah. Starting from... Two weeks from now, we will have a two-class sub-course that is uh, uh, dealing with the history of Islam. The reason why the Quran is filled with contradictions is because Muhammad had different stages in his life and he delivered Quran passages in each of those stages. Some of them were peaceful, some of them were violent. At the beginning of his ministry, in the year 610 A.D., when Muhammad first started to claim to be a prophet, he did not intend to start a new religion. In fact, the word Islam means submission. All that he preached was for the pagan Arabs to submit to God, the God of the Bible. That's how it started. If you read the earlier Quran surahs, they did not have any new theology at all. 
believe in God, believe in the Bible, follow the way, the correct way of the Jews and Christians before you, shun idols, give money to the poor, these kind of things, at least from Muhammad's perspective of what the Bible really is. Then at a certain time, that would be around the year 621, Muhammad delivered the first passage that marked a departure from the biblical teaching when he delivered a new kosher law in which he said camels are not allowed in the law of Moses, but they are allowed in the law of Islam. Making the word Islam, which means submission, a generic word that describes a separate religion. That's when Islam started to be a separate religion. And by the way, at that time, Islam or Muslims were a minority in their place. They were passive. They were uh, uh, peaceful. The authority of the Quran heavily depended on the authority of the Bible at that time. Later on, after this blue line, when Muhammad migrated from Mecca, a city in Saudi Arabia, to Medina, another city in Saudi Arabia, that's when Muhammad said, by the way, before that, Muhammad said, well, Islam is a separate religion, but all the other faiths are equally valid. They are ways to God. Muslims will go to heaven as well as Christians and Jews. After Muhammad migrated to Medina, Islam became the only way to God. In fact, he started to wage war against anyone who does not convert to Islam. Became the exclusive way to God. And after the Quran started to depend on the authority of the Bible, uh, Muhammad delivered a passage in which he said, if you find any differences between the Bible and the Quran, you follow what the Quran says and not the Bible. So basically he made the Quran superior to the Bible. The Quran passages in the earlier part of Muhammad's, uh, quote, ministry, unquote, were general in time and place. That supports the Muslim claim that the Quran is eternal. It talks about God, heaven, hell, righteousness, evil, prophets of old, things like that. After the migration, most of the passages were local. They dealt with specific situations that Muhammad had to deal with in his community, in his time, which kind of... Uh, uh, does not give the impression that the Quran is eternal when it deals with such narrow situations. The Quran was compiled, yes, sir. So, I'm just curious, is there a lot of households over there now that have um, access to the Bible to compare it to the Quran? Most people do not want the Bible, do not want to read the Bible in the Muslim world because they believe that since the Quran is superior to the Bible, you do not need to waste your time, especially that they know that the Bible preaches a different message than the Quran. Uh, salvation through Jesus Christ and his death on the cross, which is considered blasphemy in Islam. The Quran was compiled and standardized after the death of Muhammad. Those Bible passages that were sorry, those Quran passages that were delivered in these times were shuffled as you would shuffle a pack of playing cards. Mm -hmm. And that's why when you read the Quran, you would see a violent passage and then a peaceful passage and then a violent passage and then, then you do not know the truth about Islam. Of course, Muslims would quote the peaceful passages when they want to market Islam to you. Uh, other people, the, the anti-Muslims, the Islamophobes, would quote the violent passages. And that is the source of confusion uh, on what Islam is really all about. So let's apply those three simple rules. By the way, we will get in detail the, the life of Muhammad and the evolution in Islam and the roots of Islam starting from two weeks from now and then the week after that, Lord willing. The first myth, of course, the most common controversial subject uh, in the world today is Islam a religion of peace. Some people have been politicized that. Every time I preach about this in churches, they would say, well, a certain president says that Islam is a religion of peace, which means he's a false president. He does not deserve to be there. His party does not to be, uh, deserve to be there. But guess what? This is not a partisan thing. This is a bipartisan thing. Two presidents, I think they are radical on two uh, uh, radically different extremes of the political spectrum in the United States. They both said that. These are politicians. It's not their job to tell you about the faith. It's your job. 
They both say that Islam is peace, of course, for political purposes. And that's the difference between a politician and a Christian. A politician is there to pursue solutions. A Christian is there to pursue the truth. What does the Quran say that in every passage that applies to the modern day Muslims? Chapter 8 or Surah 8, verse 60, the Quran says, Prepare against them whatever force you can and the taint, uh, trained horses whereby you terrorize Allah's enemy and your own enemy. The Quran commands Muslims to be terrorists. Are Muslims terrorists? Most of them are not. They choose not to be terrorists. They would think that there is an interpretation of the, a, a, a mystic interpretation of this passage that does not apply to them. They don't want to be violent to other people, but this is not what Islam tells them to be. Surah 8, and by the way, Surahs 8 and 9 are the two most violent chapters in the Quran. They are both uh, 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 a part of the later, the chronologically later passages of, of the Quran. Fight them until persecution is no more and religion is all for Allah. This is the great commission of the Quran. Spread the Islamic faith using force. That's why it was necessary to study what the Bible says, uh, the way to spread the Christian faith. 9-5, kill the polytheists. By the way, we are considered polytheists to Muslims because we worship Jesus Christ as the Bible tells us to. Muslims do not consider Jesus to be deity, so they would consider that polytheism. And Muslims are commanded to kill the polytheists wherever you find them and catch them and besiege them and sit in ambush for them everywhere. Remember last year when there was an ISIS propaganda video that called for people in the United States to ambush uh, people in the uniforms and the, the, the military and the police officers and, and, and people started to attack police officers with machetes and uh, 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 an ambush. They were responding to this Quran passage. 47.4, when you encounter those who disbelieve, then aim at smiting the next. Behead those uh, who do not believe in Islam and fight the polytheists all together as they fight you all together. And according to this passage, not a single man, woman, child, and elderly in this uh, uh, building is excused from being a victim of this passage. The Quran tells Muslims to do that to all polytheists. By the way, I promise you, if Muslims took the Quran literally, there would not be any non-Muslim on earth. But most Muslims do not want to do that. Uh, myth number two says that Islam disrespects women. This is very common in the Western world. And this is actually true and not a myth. The Quran says in chapter 2, verse 222, women have rights similar to what they owe. This passage regulates the division of properties when a man divorces his wife. Divorce is easy in Islam, remarriage is easy. And it says for men, though for men, there is a step above them. According to this Quran passage, men are superior to women. They are not equal, as the Bible teaches. 434, as uh, uh, for women of whom you feel rebellion. Rebellion is not necessarily adultery. It can mean if a woman calls her friend from high school, that can be considered rebellion. Uh, uh, convince them, that's number one, and leave them apart in bed, and verse 3, beat them. The Quran tells Muslim men to beat up their wives as the Bible tells Muslim men to love their wives. This is what the Quran says about women. Uh, 65, 4. Those women from among you who have despaired of... This uh, passage regulates how long a divorced woman should wait before she gets married before she gets remarried to a different person. If she's pregnant, she has to wait until she delivers the baby. If she's not pregnant, she'll have to wait at least three months to make sure that she is not pregnant, as well as of those who have not yet menstruated. The Quran actually regulates women, uh, marriage to women under age. Myth number three, Muhammad is a prophet of God. The uh, Quran claims that. Muhammad claims to be a prophet of God. And we have studied uh, how can you tell that a certain person is inspired or is a prophet of God. Let's see what the Quran says about that. What is the very definition of the word prophet? 7, 188. By the way, the Quran does not record any uh, prophecy ever. Not only that, the Quran says in verse 7, uh, in, in, in chapter 7, in verse 188, Muhammad says, if I had the knowledge of the unseen, I would have accumulated a lot of good things. Basically, Muhammad said, if I was a prophet, I would have gone to Las Vegas. 
this is what he meant, uh, or Wall Street, or whatever. I would have made a fortune if I was a prophet, if I knew what was unseen. Uh, chapter 17, verses 90 through 93. People suspected that Muhammad was not proving that he is a prophet, so they told him, we shall never believe in you unless you cause a spring to gush forth for us from the earth, or you have a garden of date palms and graves, and, 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 and they gave him a list of miracles that he had to choose from, and Muhammad was told, say, I proclaim the purity of my Lord, I am nothing but human, a messenger. Not only does the Quran not record any miracle that Muhammad did, the Quran said that Muhammad is not a miracle maker, and hence he was not empowered by God to prove that he has a divine message. If Muhammad was not inspired, we studied that last week, to produce the Quran, then what are its resources? If you read the Quran, you will see stories that are familiar from other resources. The apocryphal books, uh, Arabia in the 7th century AD was filled with heresies and with cults and, and, and with a lot of things, with apocryphal scriptures like the infancy Gospel of Thomas, which is not a part of the Christian canon. The Jewish Talmud is actually considered inspired by the Quran. The Quran quotes a lot of uh, things. The Hebrew Bible, that would be what we know today as the Old Testament part of the Bible, is another resource. The Orthodox traditions, uh, like the story of the seven sleepers, those in the early Christian uh, time, in the early part of the church history, escaped from the persecution of the Romans, hid in a cave, slept for three centuries, and then woke up. That story is recorded in the Orthodox traditions. They actually celebrate it. They have a day for them. And the Quran quotes that story. Uh, as well, uh, of course, as the records of Muhammad's contemporary events. His life and his war. Myth number four. Guess who said that? ISIS is not Islam. And don't say his name. We have seen earlier that Islam... Uh, commands his, uh, its followers to wage war. We have seen the map on how Islam spread it, uh, uh, how, how Islam, the Islamic faith, was spread by the early Muslims, those who sat at the feet of Muhammad uh, last week, and we compared that with how Christianity was spread by the power of the Holy Spirit that was working through the apostles, Paul and, and the, other, the rest of the apostles. Well, the Quran says, fight those people of the book. Not in self-defense. You be on the offense. You fight the people of the book. Anyone who believes in this book, who do not believe in Allah, and who do not profess the correct religion, that would be Islam, until they pay tribute with their own hands while they are subdued. The Quran commands Muslims to fight any non-Muslim, especially those Jews and Christians. And by the way, that is a chronologically later passage. The earlier passages were peaceful to Christians. Muslims would quote them to you. And they would also quote to you the passages from the time when Muhammad said that Islam is just another religion and Christianity and Judaism are equally valid. They are both way to God. These do not apply. This is the passage that has abrogated all those passages. This is the passage that is correctly being used by ISIS now whenever they uh, claim responsibility for anything. Whenever they invade a village, they would uh, give three options. Well, the early Muslims did that. The early Muslims, whenever they invade a, a village or, or conquer a nation, they would give three options to its citizens. You either convert to Islam, you either pay the tribute, or you get killed. ISIS is more liberal and more open-minded than the earlier Muslims because they gave them a fourth option. Get out of your property and leave. And give your properties to us. 4, 23, 24, forbidden unto you. This is like Leviticus 18, the passage that regulates marriage. Uh, to whom, to what kind of woman you can marry. Forbidden unto you are your mothers and your daughters and your sisters and all the married women, save those captives whom your right hands possess. So when you invade a nation, all the married women in that nation becomes your personal property. And that is what ISIS is doing today. Myth number five. The Quran confirms the Bible. The Quran claims over uh, and over again, not only that it confirms the Bible, but in this passage it says that it, its whole authority depends on the authority of the Bible. The Quran says it is not an invented story, but rather a confirmation of what has been before it. So the Quran is defending itself against the claim that it is a made-up story by saying, trust me, I am not made up. And my proof is that I confirm 
uh, what, what, what came before me. For example, if I claim that I am Mike Canty's brother, and I would say, oh, trust me, believe me, I will prove to you that I am Mike Canty's brother. I look like him. And you would look at the two of us and we do not look anything like each other. What does that make of my claim? This is exactly what is happening. Uh, as we have seen, the Quran delivers a completely different message than the theme message of the Bible. God's holiness, man's sinfulness, salvation by Jesus Christ, death on the cross alone. The Quran claims to confirm the Bible, but the Quran completely has uh, a perverted idea of the Bible accounts. In the first passage, uh, Saul is leading the good unites to fight Goliath. Obviously, we do not have any Sunday school teacher here. She would have laughed. Saul is fighting the Gideonites to, to, to fight Goliath. Okay, in the second story, Pharaoh of Egypt commands Haman of Persia to build the Tower of Babylon. You did not get those three in one story, right? Obviously. So, whoever uh, uh, claimed to have received the Quran had a completely perverted and confused idea of what the Bible really said. These are three stories that are a thousand years uh, between each other. Pharaoh and, and, and Haman of Persia from the book of Esther and, and the Tower of uh, Babylon, the tower that gets into heaven. Uh, this myth says that the Quran is consistent. Your question, uh, uh, like a... Uh, uh, the Muslims would say the Bible is corrupt, the Bible has different uh, translations while the Quran is consistent. This is not what the Quran says about itself. In fact, the Quran says in uh, chapter 16, verses 101 and 102, that's the doctrine of abrogation. The chronologically later passages supersede or abrogate the earlier passages. So if the earlier passage was peaceful, which is still used and quoted by the uh, Muslim, uh, the, the liberal Muslims here in the United States, that does not apply to the modern-day Muslims anymore. Whenever we uh, replace a verse with another verse, they say you are but a forger. The fact, rather, is that most of them are ignorant, say this has been brought down by the Holy Spirit from your Lord. So, Muhammad is told in the Quran that if anyone tells him that the Bible is, uh, the, the Quran is inconsistent, say, well, the Holy Spirit kept changing his mind on me all the time. 2. 106. Whenever we abrogate a verse or cause it to be forgotten, we bring one better than it or one equal to it. Not only did Muhammad replace Quran passages and change his theology during the 23 years of his mission in which he claims to be a, a prophet, but also he forgot some of the revelations that he himself delivered. Uh, one of the uh, things when I compare the Bible with the Quran is that the Bible has been written by at least 40 men in the three continents of the ancient world within the time uh, frame of at least 1,500 years, and it came as one book with one consistent message. The Quran was written by one man, or at least claimed to have been delivered by and, and through one man in 23 years in two cities in one country, and it contradicts each, uh, each other uh, 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 contradicts itself so much that it says it contradicts itself. Myth number seven, Islam respects the laws of the land. Once again, this is about the Islamic faith, not the Muslim citizens who live here in Dearborn, most of whom are good citizens. I have been living in the Detroit area for two years. I am a news watcher. I have not seen many things that Muslims in Dearborn did. Uh, if, if, if they were to be uh, like not good citizens in proportion to what have been claimed about them, this would be a much different place in a very bad way. But this is not what Islam tells them to be. Islam tells uh, uh, Muslims not to obey the disbelievers uh, and the hypocrites, which is used by Muslim scholars to claim that we have to have a pro-Islam law. And we do not have to obey the laws of the land if they are against the Islamic law, the Sharia law. Myth number eight says that Islam recognizes the other Abrahamic religions as alternative ways to God. That's why Muslims in the Grand Mosque of Dearborn have those interfaith meetings all the time and they invite everybody in the neighborhood, the Jews and the uh, uh, you know, Catholics and the Methodists, and they would say, well, we all worship the same God, we are okay with all faiths. Yes, the Quran said that at a certain point, but then all those passages were abrogated by passages like these. Truly, the recognized religion in the sight of Allah is Islam. 
Whoever seeks a faith other than Islam, it will never be accepted from him, and he in the hereafter will be among the losers. The Bible says, Jesus said in the Bible, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Islam says no one comes to God except by me. You can choose either of them, but do not say that these are two uh, alternative ways to God because they both disagree with you. They both say that there is only one way to God. It's either Islam or Christianity. You do your homework and you come to your own conclusion. Myth number nine, science proves the Quran is true. There are tons of uh, proofs that this is not true, but this is my favorite one. And it talks about a man by the name Dilkarnain, believed by Muslim scholars to be Alexander the Great. And he was traveling and he came to the place where the sun actually sets. And he saw the sun setting in a miry spring. The Quran says that the sun sets in a pond of muddy waters. Of course, we have NASA images that beg to differ now, right? Uh, myth number 10, Islam assures you of salvation. The word salvation does not even exist in the Quran. The Quran is not about salvation. The final myth, Islam calls for loving your neighbor, and this is the most heartbreaking uh, thing that uh, 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 Islam teaches. Uh, 551, Muslims are commanded to take not the Jews and the Christians for friends. They are friends one to one another. He among you who taketh them for friends is one of them. Uh, a, a woman, a, a, a Christian family in Houston had their uh, daughter dating a Muslim man and eventually ended up marrying him. And they were trying to talk with her and they were desperate. Uh, finally, they said, they were talking to the man and they said, the, the Muslim man, and they said, well, you have officially become family. We, we, you are our son-in-law now. And we love you, and because of that, we have to be in contact with each other. We love you. They ended the phone call with, we love you. And he did not say, I love you back. And he was responding to this passage. You are not supposed to love Jews and Christians. And that was one of the earliest uh, uh, reasons when I was a teenager in the middle of the 1990s in Iraq, when hatred was preached in the Muslim community, when we were told that it is wrong to love people who are different than us. That was when I was seeking beauty and goodness in every other source other than Islam. Once again, I hope we have straightened out some of the common misconcepts of Islam in the Western world according to what the Quran would say about themselves if it were to be handled correctly. Uh, I have studied the Quran in uh, Iraq and mosques and in schools and it was everywhere. And I hope I have been able to give you a clear description uh, of Islam. Two weeks from now, we will have a class by the name Abraham, Muhammad, and the Golden Butterfly that talks about the origins of Islam. Then after that, the life of Muhammad and the evolution of Islam. Brother Mike, would you lead us in a concluding prayer?